Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's a great pleasure to have Professor Keith Ross from Polytechnic University come here to give a talk on attacks on and from peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems. Professor Ross joined Polytechnic University in January 2003. Before that, he was at Eurocom for five years and at UPenn for 12 years. He got his PhD from University of Michigan. Professor Ross has a diversified research interest covering peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, internet measurement, uh, web caching, video streaming, etc. He is currently associate editor for IEEE ACM Transaction on Networking and has served on numerous other journal editorial board and their conference TPC members. He also served as advisor for FTC on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Professor Ross is a co-author of the very popular book, Computer Networking, a top-down approach featuring the Internet. He was also the founder and the CEO of uh, Wimba, uh, which is an Internet startup that uh, uh, develop and market Java-based asynchronous and synchronous VoIP applications. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's hear the interesting talk from Professor Ross. Well, thank you very much again for that. For the introduction. Um, so I'm just going to get right into the talk. Uh, this is uh, joint work with um, two others, and I put their photos up here because not only am I proud of their you know, great research skills, but they're also two of the most handsome students I've had, and I <laughs> want to show them to you. So, uh, so first one is Jian Liang. He's a PhD student, and he's actually an intern here at Microsoft. I believe today is his last day. Many of you know him. He has been instrumental in much of what I'm about to talk about today. Uh, and uh, so just wanted to acknowledge his input. Another is uh, Noam Noamov. He is a, a master's student. He's left Polytechnic. He was um, a very, very strong master's student and, and got involved in much of this research that we're going to talk about today. So um, just uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give basic. We've been working in this area for... Uh, two or three years, um, I guess two years, and uh, in parallel of other projects, and uh, just basically going to give a summary of of three different papers that we wrote, sort of high level summary. But if you want me to dig down deeper at any point, feel free to you know ask questions. I know you will, and we'll get deeper into some of the issues. The way I'm presenting it here is fairly high level, though. So just, uh, and so it's basically one, one, paper, uh, one paper deals with pollution. We're going to talk about that. Another talk deals with index poisoning. We're going to talk about that. And a third one talks about exploiting P2P systems for DDoS attacks. We're going to get into that as well. So what, as a rough, rough uh, just high level, what we're going to look at is two things here. We're going to look at attacks on P2P systems. Suppose you have some large-scale P2P system. In this talk, we're going to focus on P2P file sharing systems, or of course, many other types of um, applications that can uh, be designed with a P2P architecture. But here, we're going to focus on file sharing systems. And we're going to look at how um, one might be able to, um, to uh, attack a, 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 a P2P file system and look at some specific examples out there. The other thing I want to look at in the last third of the talk is attacks from P2P systems to um, arbitrary uh, hosts. So suppose that uh, you have an attacker out there, say Trudy, who wants to launch an attack on Bob. Bob might be, for example, a mail server, a web server, a DNS server, what have you, an individual. How can Trudy exploit some large-scale P2P system to uh, launch a, a large-scale distributed denial of service attack against Bob? So those are what we're going to look at here. So, let's, let's, so first we'll go to the first issue, uh, attacks on P2P systems. So what are some of the ways that uh, P2P systems can be attacked? One thing we can do is attack the content, try to somehow modify the content in some way. 
we'll, we're, we're going to get into this. We'll talk about this more explicitly very soon. Uh, many um, uh, P2P systems have, some, have an overlay network, and messages are routed over the overlay network. Um, so uh, there's, uh, to do the uh, routing over the, uh, over the net uh, network, we have routing tables, overlay routing tables. We can attempt to attack those routing tables, uh, manipulate those routing tables, poison those routing tables, so that tra traffic does not get directed to where it should uh, be directed to. Um, uh, in many uh, file sharing systems, there's an index that somehow maps uh, content to IP addresses and port numbers. We can try to attack that in index. We can try to bring it down. We can try to uh, poison that index. Uh, th these are things that can be done. Uh, of course, we can try to, if there's a software vulnerability, for, you know, if some P2P system is widely deployed and has a, a software vu vulnerability that we can um, uh, exploit, we can make, perhaps use that to bring down the node, take over the node that that system is running on, um, or use that node to, uh, as part of a denial of service attack. Again, as before, as I mentioned, uh, one possibility is use, uh, you know, P2P systems, because there are so many nodes, there are obvious candidates for platforms for denial of service attacks, so that's another thing that we want to look at. And another possibility is an attack that we can do, and this is something we've been talking about a little bit here at Microsoft past few days, is modifying the client, modifying the P2P client. So um, if somehow we get a hold of the source code or if we do some kind of reverse engineering or whatever, we may be able to create a new client that, uh, for example, that um, only um, takes from the system and doesn't give to the system. And this is something that's been done uh, in the past already. Um, one classic example is so-called the Cause of Light client that was very popular a few years ago. Excuse me. So uh, what we're going to look at in t today, we're going to look at three of these issues. How to attack content, how to attack uh, overlay routing. Um, uh, actually, we're going to look at four of these issues. Attack uh, distributed index and also uh, denial of service attacks. <clears throat> So let's look. There's, we're going to focus on two types of attacking uh, a network. One is uh, what we refer to as pollution, and the other is index poisoning. And um, we've, invest we've, we've investigated these two. It turns out that these two attacks have been deployed on a large scale um, and have been successfully deployed. Uh, so uh, we're going and and so we're going to uh, look at that. We're going to look how we're going to look at these attacks in the context of two file sharing systems. One is uh, Fast Track Kazaa. Uh, and when we did this study, uh, Fast, uh, Fast Track Kazaa was um, uh, Kazaa. You know, Fast Track is the protocol, and Kazaa is the is the user interface, the most popular client for the Fast Track protocol. There are a number of other. Um, uh, clients for fast track, but th uh, when we did the study a year or two back here for this particular network, uh, fast track was by far the most popular P2P file sharing system with uh, several millions of concurrent users sharing you know, huge amounts of content. It's an unstructured P2P network. By that we mean it doesn't use a distributed hash table, uh, and so that's one network we're going to look at here. And the second one we're going to look at is Overnet. Now, Overnet is still a very popular network. It's a, a critical component of the eDonkey file sharing system. And, um, and one thing, what's interesting about Overnet is that it does use a distributed hash table. It's based on a distributed hash table. It's probably the largest deploy distributed hash table in existence today. There's been a lot of academic research about DHTs, but this is you know, probably the only one, to my knowledge, that has enjoyed large-scale deployment uh, to date. So anyway, so, what, so the reason we, you know, look, one reason why we're looking at these two networks is that they're very different. One is an unstructured uh, P2P network. The other one is a, is a structured DHT-based P2P network. So let's talk about pollution. Now, um, so that's one, so this is an uh, attack. Most, many of you are familiar with this attack. The basic idea is you have the attacker or the attack company and take some original content 
and it corrupts that content. In many ways, it can do that in many ways. It can add white, it might be a song, for example, and add you know, some white noise in the middle of the song, 20 seconds of white noise. Or might put an advertisement in there. Or might replace that song with some other song. Somehow, it, somehow it, you know, it changes the content. Then what it would do is it would uh, attach many nodes to the P2P file sharing system. So suppose we're attacking, for example, uh, Kazaa. Then we would you know, attach many nodes to the internet and run Kazaa or some customized version of Kazaa uh, at each one of those nodes. Then what we would do as the attacker is we would, depo we would deposit copies of our corrupted content into uh, each of the nodes. So we have, for so again, we have a say a song that we want to target. There's one particular song that we want to attack here. We we pollute that by corrupting it. Then we uh, we we make these connections with these nodes here. These nodes will typically have very high speed uh, connections, and then we deposit copies into each of those nodes. Yes. Or some local copy of the file or something. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, are they corrupting the main copy of the file or uh, some stored copy or you know, something like that? They're corrupting any copy. They, you know, they they can just take the CD, which is what this what they probably what they do, rip it to get a you know MP3 version, and then corrupt that, corrupt, corrupt their own copy. Okay, yeah. Then. Um, what happens, what comes along now, this is, this is typically the, t the titles that are being target, targeted are, are popular titles, very popular titles for that week or month. So Alice and Bob come along, uh, and they're unsuspecting users. Alice goes ahead and does a search and finds out that a copy of the song that she wants is available at some node, and this particular node has a high bandwidth connection. Alice does not know that that particular version of the song is corrupted. She has no idea. All she knows is it's available at that node, and that node perhaps has a high bandwidth connection. So she proceeds to download a copy of the song from that node. So now she has corrupted content. Now, you know, as many of you know, these way these P2P file sharing systems work, people don't always necessarily listen to it as soon as they download it. You, know, they, you might you know, order many, many songs or many whatever, many files, go have dinner, go to sleep, Next morning, they're all there for you to, to enjoy. So perhaps Alice did that. She, she, she ordered that uh, song, and, uh, and then she went to have dinner. And Bob then comes along and downloads it from Alice. So Bob does a search, sees that Alice has it, and he chooses to download it from Alice. So now Alice has a, uh, So now Bob also has a copy. So and we see in this manner, this pollution proliferates through the network. The pollution companies can introduce that in a, in a, a small number of nodes, and, and and what they hope is that a lot of people will download that the, the, the polluted content into the into their nodes, and then others will download from them, and it will just proliferate through the network, uh, in, in in that manner. So Bob here in this case did you know listen to the to the corrupted content and and was dissatisfied. So the idea, of course, is to in the long run the goal well. So why want, um, so, so that's, the, that's the pollution attack. Any questions about the pollution attack before we move on to the index poisoning attack? Sort of a high level description of the pollution attack, yes. So this assumes that there is no way for the receiver to verify the content, right? For example, in BitTorrent, this wouldn't happen, correct? BitTorrent generally wouldn't happen, although we were talking about this. There is a, a recent attack against BitTorrent um, uh, and because, uh, so you're right. This, you're largely right that um, this assumes that the receiver can't verify the content. So um, that that yeah, that's that's right. Um, and which isn't done, which really can't be done in an effective way in 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 these systems here. Now BitTorrent has you know what happens is in BitTorrent. When you want to download some file, you first go to the tracker. The tracker provides you with hashes of the various chunks in the file, right? And then as you receive the chunks from various nodes, you can you know, run your own hash on the chunk and see if it matches the hash that you got from the tracker. If it doesn't match, then you can throw it away and go out and get a replacement chunk. 
So that mechanism works pretty well. There is a one flaw in the BitTorrent protocol. I've been told that there is an attack on that now that's being fa is fairly successful, is that um, BitTorrent actually distributes smaller, they have, they have chunks and they have the smaller units or pieces. The pieces are 16 kilobytes and the chunks are 256 kilobytes. And so what happens is that the attackers now, when you, start you go out and request various pieces, they will give you a bad piece, just one bad piece. Every, you know, they'll just try to get, give you a bad piece for every chunk. So then you'll go out and get all the pieces, gather them together, and then do your hash check and find out that it's, um, it's, uh, it, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't match the hash that you get from the tracker. You throw out the whole chunk in that case. You don't keep it, and then you have to go through the whole process again. So uh, because the, this BitTorrent uses this two-layer scheme here of chunks and pieces, um, they've, they're, you know, there's some, some, some problems there as well. Anyway, so that's just a side issue. Yes? I mean, on the poisoning part, uh, from a practical investigation standpoint, are there clear symptoms besides the hash? Because regular PP user, they can download anything, right? On the investigation, is there a clear symptom that will show us that this activity is occurring? That uh, the poisoning? The poisoning? Because I, I, you know, for example, I downloaded that file. It's like, well, it's just a bad connection or something. Is there like saturation of network? Is it like, well, it's an obvious file hash? Is there a clear symptom that this behavior is occurring? Um. So you basically, you want to try to detect whether a file is is being is 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 is, is, is occurring. Yes. Well, you know, we're going to talk about a mechanism here to 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 um, to t attempt to quantify how how much of it is occurring. Okay. okay. But uh, yeah. So maybe let's go on a little bit. Maybe uh, that question we can, can come back to that. All right. So the other attack is um, we noticed that when we first got into this, we noticed that. Um, the, uh, at least Fast Track was under an enormous pollution attack back in around 2004, 2005. And um, then more recently, uh, a year or 18 months ago, we noticed that there was another attack being, uh, that these, 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 these networks were um, uh, under attack by another mechanism altogether, and that's uh, what we call index poisoning. And the idea is slightly different. So the first one we've referred to as pollution. This one we refer to as index poisoning. And the idea is very simple. Most of these file sharing systems, almost all of these file sharing systems, have some kind of index. Napster had an index. Kazaa has an index. eDonkey, et cetera. Nutella, uh, et cetera. An index basically may be distributed, may be centralized. But what it does is, you know, you know it's done in different ways. But at a very high level, what it does is it, it maps titles of content, songs, movies, whatever, to okay, locations, IP addresses, and port numbers. Okay, so when, uh, when, a when Alice is interested in finding, obtaining some, say, some file, then she can, which has some kind of name like Big Party, she can search the index and find out the IP addresses and port numbers that have copies of that file. Then she can make a direct TCP connection to that uh, node and download the content. So what you know, what the attack is here is to somehow poison this index by putting indexes have records by putting lots and lots of bogus records into the index. So many bogus records that the index becomes essentially unusable. Okay, so that's the index attack. So here in this example, here we have all these uh, all these um, um, values here. And Trudy comes along, and somehow she figures out some way of inserting, you know, and it's not very hard to do in these P2P systems because they're so open, but to insert into the index some bogus. So maybe there's some, a song that, that she wants to attack called Big Hit, and so she puts in the title Big Hit, and she puts in an IP address for a node that's not there. Later, when someone comes along and searches for it, let me see if I have a slide for that. No. Uh, when someone, when Alice say comes along and searches for Big Hit, she finds out that a copy is available at this IP address. She tries to make an IP, uh, she tries to make a TCP connection to it. It fails. She gets some kind of message, maybe like 
uh, trying or more sources need it, then maybe she'll, you know, she'll go down again and try another one and another one. And, and if there's some, there are many, many, many bogus entries, she'll get you know, frustrated and perhaps eventually give up on the system. So that's the ultimate goal of the attackers, right? Is, is to frustrate the user so much that they, they give up on, um, on, on using these systems and they go out to Tower Records, whatever, and buy the CD instead, right? Rather than getting it from the file sharing system. Yes? So did you manage to quantify historically how successful the pollution and index poisoning attacks were? Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, you know, who are the people doing these attacks? Are they script kiddies or, you know, a few high school, gra college graduates? Uh, it turns out that they are actually companies that are doing these attacks. You know, bono you know regular companies, uh, there's, there's two of them here, Media Century. They have, you know, nice fancy West, uh, websites over here. These two, there's, there's a half a dozen of them at least out there that do this. These two are both located in, in New York City. Uh, one reason why I think that is is because media, New York City is one media center, and so they want to be near the, the customers. Um, and both of these companies employ about 10 to 20 people that you know, specialize in attacking P2P systems. And, and who are the customers of these companies, do you think? You know, these, com these companies have to pay for their website and their employees and their equipment and all the traffic that they may be generating. Who are their, you know, they have to, have, obviously they have a lot of costs. Who are, their, who are them, who are providing their, huh? Record labels and, you know, movie company, you know, movie companies. So, you know, RIAA and the MPAA and things of that sort. So, um, and I have, you know, I have, I have no opinion either way about this. I'm just, and, you know, that's true. I'm just, uh, you know, we are you know, taking very much a, Unbiased, you know, opinion. I am not for or against the distribution of, you know, unauthorized content on the internet. Just, you know, just just talking about, you know, the technology and attacks and other interesting things about it. So, very quickly, a review of these two file sharing. What we did do is an extensive measurement study of how successful these attacks are in both fast track and in overnet. And so, to uh, explain to you what we did. Let's just briefly review how Fast Track and Overnet work. So, Fast Track um, was what the first peer to peer network, it's an unstructured network, um, but, uh, but it was the first one that employed this super no concept, uh, where basically what it did was, it, you know, among all the peers participating, it identified the nodes that are more powerful, have, that are up more often, and have high bandwidth connections. And that, that's done sort of automatically. A node identifies itself of, uh, uh, of that situation and declares itself a super node. And so there's a super, so a fraction, of, a small fraction of nodes are super nodes, and they organize themselves in an overlay network with TCP connections connected among themselves. And then, uh, and then all the other nodes, the, the vast majority of nodes, are are leaves uh, on this uh, to to super nodes. So every ordinary node has a a parent which is a super node. This, you know, this, this is, so this was the original Fast Track design. Uh, Fast Track slash Kazaa, the, the, the people that started that were the same people, the, two, the founders that started Skype, the very popular voice over IP system. And they again employed a kind of hierarchical structure in Skype as well for a notion of, of, of super nodes. So anyway, um, whoops, how come I'm, okay. Excuse me. All right, so how do, how do things work here? Alice comes along. She want, she's looking for a particular title. She sends a query to her supernode. The supernode may respond. The supernode is, each supernode keeps a tr tr as an index of all the nodes, all of its children nodes. So the supernode knows what all of its children have. Okay? And so she might ask for a popular song. That particular supernode may know that one of, one of, one of, the children, one of its children has a copy of that song, sends back a response to Alice. Also, the supernode may pass the, uh, Alice's query onto one or more other supernodes, which in turn may respond back to Alice. So they're responding here. Finally, so at the end of her, at, at, at the end of her search, Alice has a list of, of different uh, uh, locations that have the, the, the title that she's interested in. 
So she goes out and sends an HTTP request to one of those locations and then gets the file uh, back in a P2P file transfer. So that's how super, uh, fast track works. Key point to, uh, that we want to keep in mind here is that each one of these super nodes maintains an index for all of its children. So it's a localized index for its children. Question. Yes? Does the super node constantly change? Does, do these companies constantly for the no, no. So the super nodes are, are 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 just ordinary nodes owned by you and me and students at universities. So they're just high, you know. Ten, very often, there you know there might be a node on a campus because nodes on campuses have um, you know you know have high bandwidth connections. So they're just there, and they might you know they, and if this guy shuts down, then they just reorganize themselves. So these guys will realize that he shut down, and they'll 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 find a new super node to connect to. You automatically, again, it's a proprietary protocol, so I don't know the exact details, but I do know that each one does it automatically and individually. So, you know, you, you declare yourself a superno because you're, you're measuring how often you're connected to the system and how much bandwidth you have. And if you exceed these thresholds, then you're going to declare yourself a, a supernode node and advertise to other super roads that you are now a super node so that they can put you in the super node network. Yeah, sure. All right, um, very, very quickly, um, Overnet uses a DHT, a distributed hash table. How many of you have heard of distributed hash tables before here? Who, is, who has not heard of a distributed hash table? All right, just very quickly, let's talk about what it is. But you know, the functionality is as following. Every node has an ID in an ID space, and messages have keys in the same ID space. And basically, the functionality of the DHT is the DHT finds the node with the ID closest to the key. So I have a message that has some key, and I give it to this DHT, this black box. The DHT finds, to me, finds for me the node whose ID is closest to the, uh, to the key value. Okay, now how is that implemented? Uh, nodes, you want, nodes you know, inside the black box, the nodes organize themselves in an overlay network, and the DHT routes messages over the overlay in some efficient manner to find the closest key. So very quickly, as a quick example here, here's one approach. It's a very simple DHT called consistent hash hashing. Here we have uh, a number of nodes, eight nodes or so. They have their identifiers here. These are their, their node IDs. And they have, they have na we have an overlay network that's like this. So this guy has a TCP connection to here and a TCP connection to here. So everyone has two neighbors here. Now suppose that um, basically the question is, is you, have a, you, you want to find now Who's, res who's responsible for this particular key, 1110? By responsible, we mean who, which, which node is closest to it, or which is, what is the closest successor to this node? Well, the closest successor to this node is this guy over here, right? This is the closest successor. But he doesn't know that. He has a very localized vision. He only knows about these two things over here. And so he wants to use the, DD, uh, the DHT to find the node that's the closest su successor. So how's that done? Very simple in, in this DHT is you just send the message around with that key in it. And they keep on passing it around here until you get to the node that is indeed the closest su successor. And he sends a message back to the original node, the querying node, and, and, and tells that querying node that he's responsible, that 1111 with some IP address is responsible for that key. All right, so how is this done in Overnet? What goes on in Overnet? Now, Overnet... Is, is a DHT-based system where um, basically we're going to publish the locations of content into the DHT. So, so for example, if you want to find out who has a song, say, the Beatles' Hey Jude, you're going to send some kind of message into Overnet or a series of messages into Overnet, and this DHT is going to uh, locate uh, the, the, uh, the node that's, um, uh, that, has the, uh, that has the content. So how's that done? So first, let's do the publishing first. Suppose you have uh, information to publish. You're going to send in there two advertisement messages into there. The first one is that you have some, some content. The content has hash. You take a hash of that content, right? So you have hash and you have, and the, uh, so you're, you're, you're here. 
You, have this, you just ripped this file, you created the hash, and you have an IP address. Now you want to tell the DHT um, that you have this file. You have this, that you have this, uh, uh, you have th this file. So what you do is a step back one step here. So what you do is you, you, you take a hash in a file, that becomes the key, and you send that key in there, and it gets, that gets stored up here. So this, this node then becomes responsible for the key, and this key therefore will have the record saying that uh, the file, which has, uh, with the file which is, has a file that's close to this value, is located at this IP address. So that's the first thing that you advertise there. So you basically you're just advertising you, you, this, so basically, this guy, because he has a, an ID that's close to the hash value of the file, he'll store information about that file. In particular, he'll store the IP address for the, uh, that file. But, that's, but also, you have to do something with keywords, because people in file sharing systems, they don't search using hash values. When you search for a song, you don't know the hash value. You can't put a search in there. You search using keywords. So the way that the, uh, so the way that uh, Overnet resolves that is they also hash keywords. So for every you know for song title it might be say Hey Jude they'll hash the word Hey and they'll hash the word Jude, and then they'll and then the, the, they'll send a new message into the DHT where the um, the key will be the hash of Hey, and the the, the value of that record will be the uh, the hash of the file itself. So send a message over here, and this guy will hold a record that says, hey, the word hey is associated with some file identifier, some hash, and so you'll get that file identifier back, and then after that, you can search the file identifier to find the location. So the, so the people who are doing search now have to do a two-step query as well. They first take the word hey, they hash the word, like in hey Jude, they hash, the, um, they hash that word, and then they and then they say who is you know what is the um, file identifier associated with hey so that's what this message will go to um, and um, actually this is in the way I described it actually it should go here first and then this person will respond by saying um, uh, give you the file identifier then once you know the file identifier you can say what I what, you know what IP address is is has that file identifier. So you'll send another message, and you'll, and you'll learn that. And finally, once you know the IP address, you can go ahead and contact the person who originally published the content and, and ask for a download. So it's a little bit confusing, a little complicated. I ran through that quickly, but I think most of you get the general idea. So just a little bit more background before we get into um, the measurement results. So just some terminology here. So just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. The title is the title of a song or movie. Now, a given song or movie can actually have many different versions out there in the internet, in the file sharing system. And by versions, I don't mean a live version and a studio version. I mean thousands of different versions from the same, coming, coming from the same original CD. The reason is, is that when people rip these versions, the rippers actually produce something slightly different. The bits are not exactly the same from one ripper to the next. Even the same ripper can produce different versions depending on ambient noise and so forth. Some of the bits may be a little bit different. So uh, a given title, which to us sounds exactly the same to our ear, uh, may have many, many different versions. Also, different versions come from different encoding rates as well. So it may have many, many different versions. And typically, we'll see that they often have thousands of versions. So a given title can have thousands of versions. Each version in these file sharing systems is identified by the hash of it. So the ID of that version becomes some kind of hash of that file. Okay, It might be MD5 hash or something else. And each version, now each version, of course, can have thousands of copies. Because when someone rips a song, say, and they, they create a version, and they, then they put that in their shared folder and let people, um, and, and let people download it from, from that person's shared folder, you generate copies. Many, many different people get a copy of that version. So you can have hundreds or thousands of versions of a given copy. Then you can have also non-existent versions due to the poisoning attack. 
people who are doing poisoning can list versions into the index, but those versions don't exist anywhere. Okay, so you can have also have non-existent versions. So how does index poisoning work in Kazaa and, 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 and Overnet? Well, there's many ways you can do it. Um, uh, we've talked about a pollution poison. Let's talk about, but this is the way that, 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 has, that's been, that's, that the attackers are, have been using here. So basically what you do is simply is you, um, you make a connection. So you, here we want to do, we talked about pollution already, so we're talking about poisoning now. That is corrupting that, that index. So in fast track, what you would do is you would make a connection to a supernode. Right, so you have to, you, you make you make a connection. Use a fast track client or your own customized fast track client. Make a connection to a supernode, and then uh, for some targeted song, you would you would put information in there, simply saying that um, you have the target song and you would supply the an IP address. Okay, typically, typically in fast track, you have to supply the same IP address. That your that the IP address that corresponds to your source IP address, so you could do that, right? So you could do that. So you so you basically would maintain this TCP connection, and you would just typically you would put lots and lots of bogus records in there. So you would um, so you would maybe for every single different version of this song, you would you you know there might be a thousand different versions, and for each one of them, you would you would say you have a copy when you don't, okay? And you might do that for more than one song. You might do that for many, many different, many, many titles. Okay. Now in eDonkey, um, what you would do there, uh, the way it works there, is that you have some target keyword. Again, maybe you want to talk to song Hey Jude, so your keyword's Hey. So you hash that, you hash that keyword. And, you, and corresponding to that, the record has a version ID. So you put some make-believe version ID in there, one that doesn't even exist. So you, you, again, and then you would deposit this every, in many different places within the Overnet network. So that's the general idea of how the poisoning takes place. So given that, given that these attacks are taking place in these two networks, the question we want to examine is, how effective are they? Can the, can, is it possible to, to, to launch a successful large-scale attack against these systems? It's an interesting question for, you know, people have wondered, for example, DNS, you know, it's a, another large-scale distributed system. One may ask, is it possible to launch a, a successful denial of service attack against DNS? There have been attempts. Most attempts in, in the past few years have been failed attempts, have not been successful. What about in file sharing system? Is it possible to do it there? So, um, so here's the thing. What we want to do then is we, you know, we want to for, for for these for a certain number of titles that we suspect are under attack, we want to evaluate in each of the file sharing systems what fractions of the results that you get as a user correspond to clean, uncorrupted files, the, the things that you are really looking for. And what fraction of the, uh, of the results that you would get, of course, let's go down to polluted here, are polluted files, corrupted files, okay? And what fraction of the results you get are poison, correspond to nothing, it's just junk. You click on them and nothing, nothing happens, essentially. You get a message like no source is needed. If the, these percentages are very large, if, 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 we, if a large fraction of the results are, correspond to polluted files, or to uh, poison entries, then we could more or less conclude that the attackers are being fairly successful in, in, in attacking the system. So how do you do that? One way you could do this is you could go ahead and do some kind of brute force attempt thing. So you have some title in mind, you go ahead, you, you do a search on that title, you see all the different copies that are available, you go out and try to download all those copies one by one, then those that do download, you have to determine if they're polluted or not, right? How do you determine they're polluted or not? There's no really, you know, this is still an open research problem actually for signal processors. There's no really excellent solution yet. Um, so basically what you have to do it is you go out and you find a whole bunch of master students and undergraduate students that are, they're, they're willing to spend five hours each in front of a computer and they listen to it, okay? Very, very time consuming, okay? It's not a very effective way of doing it. 
So we want to come up with a more automated procedure for determining uh, pollution levels and, and poisoning levels. So um, so here's the basic idea here. For, let's fix a title T. What was, let's fix a title T, some popular song or popular movie. And we'll have an investigation interval, T to T plus delta, which might be like an hour or something or a day. And let's let this just denote V as a set of all versions that are out there for that title. And there may be 10,000 10, versions typically. For a popular title, there are thousands of versions. Okay, so it's V. Now, that's, and among those versions, some of them are, are clean. Okay, well, some of them are poisoned. That's one. Some are polluted. That's type two. And some are clean, type three. So, uh, but we, you know, we don't know that when we, we, you know, there's all these versions out there, and we know that some of them are polluted, some are poisoned, some are clean, but we don't know much more about it. And for each version out there, let's let CV be the number of copies out there. Okay, so there's going to be a certain number of copies of that version in the file sharing system. So what we can define then is the the different levels. Like for example, we can define the poisoning level is the total number of copies that are poisoned divided by the total number of copies in the system. That would be the poisoning level. That's the fraction of copies that are poisoned. Similarly, for L2, L2 would be the total number of copies that are polluted divided by the total number of copies. And finally, L3 is the total number of copies that are clean divided by the total number of copies. All right, so that's what we want to try to estimate. Just to clarify, a poison means that the, when we make a request, the PR, she will not respond back at all, correct? That's right. Uh, polluted means that the, We'll make a response back, but it will send us the wrong file. Exactly. Yeah, right. right, exactly. So that's exactly right. And so what we want to do now, the goal is to estimate these values, L1, L2, L3, determine the fraction of polluted, poisoned, and clean copies. And to do that, uh, the, the key thing is we, what we're going to see is we need to get this information, the, the VIs and the seats, right? So some of this information is, can, so how do we get that? So first step we do is we go out and we we harvest we we go out and harvest information from these file sharing systems. So with fast track, what we do is we crawl all the super nodes. So we built Jian, who's who's not here right now, but Jian built this very powerful crawler that goes out and crawls all the super nodes very rapidly to determine to get all this information about any titles we want. So, for any, so we, we have like a list of 10 titles, and for each one of those titles, it will come back and tell us, uh, list us all the different versions that are available for that title and how many copies are available for that title. So we'll get that information. So we'll get all this information about versions and titles. We don't know which versions are corrupted, polluted. We don't, we're not getting the content. We're just, we're just getting the metadata. The crawler is just going out there and getting the metadata. And Overnet, we didn't do a crawler. We did something slightly different. What we did is we sort of, you know, create sort of a honeypot, so to speak, is we insert our own nodes. Suppose we want to know something about uh, title, you know, uh, the title Hey Jude. So we insert our own node in the network with um, an ID that, cor that it corresponds to the hash of the word Hey. All right. That way, when anyone wants to publish something about the title Hey Jude, they'll publish to us, among, they'll also publish to others as well, but they'll publish to us and we'll be able to track all the different uh, copies of the, uh, of the title Hey Jude that's out there. So, so, so there are two different ways of harvesting information. None of these, in both cases, we don't download any content. We want to avoid downloading content and analyzing content. We want to determine those, those levels strictly from the metadata that's in the systems. All right, so now we have that. So now what we have, we, we, we've got all this data. We can analyze it down uh, offline. What do we have is for, for each title that we're interested in, we do, we do know now, we have, we have V, a set of all versions. We have a list of all the versions. There's different hash values for each version. And we have C of V, the number of copies for each one of those versions. We have all that information. What we don't have is V1, V2, and V3. We don't know which of these versions are polluted um, 
poison, and clean. And we need to get those values in order to use this formula. So observation was made. Uh, these are 10 titles here. Title one through, t each color is a different title, different song, and, and here's say, for example, fast tracking over now. What we're plotting here, this is, uh, we list the, uh, these are the users here, and we're ordering the users in terms of the number of copies they have. The users to the left have more copies, have the most copies, and the users to the right have the least copies, and we're plotting the cumulative distribution. And what this curve is seeing is that for some of the titles, seven of the titles, a huge fraction of the copies are coming from a small number of users. Okay? When I say copies, these are advertised copies. They may not be real copies out there. So when I say we, the crawler gives us this information about the number of copies, it's giving us information about the number of advertised copies. Very important point. So we see that a small, small number of users are advertising a huge number of copies. So naturally, we're you, you know, very suspicious here. You would suspect that these, something's funny about these users, right? And these users, of course, we don't actually make the assumption analysis, but you know, we, we, you know, it turns, you know, it's clear that these users are the polluters, right? The polluting companies. These are normal users here, because if, 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 if and this is, you know, a shape that's something more that you would, that's more natural, something you would, more, you know, more likely see. Once again, here, same thing in Overnet. There's eight titles here that have this uh, highly skewed uh, distribution, and two that have a sort of a normal distribution. So. So given that, what we observe is that there are heavy users and light and normal users. There are some users that are doing, by heavy mean, making lots of advertisements for copies, and other users that are making some kind of normal amount. So we divided up the users by IP address, essentially, up to, into heavy users and light users. Okay, we have a heuristic, and, and, and you're a heavy user if you do a lot of advertising, you're a light user if you do moderate amount of advertising. Then um, came up with this heuristic. And um, so uh, what, let, let's let the, you know, we have heavy users. Some of those heavy users are advertising hash for, for a particular title now. Think of a particular title. Some of those heavy users are advertising hashes. Um, uh, right, they're all advertising hashes, right? Let's H of, H of H be the set of uh, uh, hashes, or sort the of set of uh, versions, ha hash and versions, the same thing. So the set of versions advertised by the heavy users. So this is the set of versions that are being advertised by the heavy users, okay? And then we have a set of versions that are being advertised by the light users. Okay, again, this is for one title over here. So now this is this, this sort of Venn diagram we have. And now from using this Venn diagram, we're going to make a, 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 we're going to use a heuristic here. And so basically the idea is as follows. Suppose that you have, there's a version that's been advertised by a heavy user, which is a polluter, and a light user. So it's in this region here. It's been advertised by both. Then we would argue that it's very likely that that version is a polluted version. Why is that? Because that version has somehow started, you know, somehow uh, a, a heavy user, right, would, uh, a polluter would not keep a copy of a clean version. So a, a polluter is going to only advertise either a poisoned version or a polluted version. And a regular user is not going to have a poisoned version because poisoned versions are non-existent. So he's not going to advertise a poisoned version. So if, if this version has been advertised by both, it's most likely polluted. Let's go back over here. Let's take this, but maybe this is easier to explain. Suppose you have a version that's advertised by a light user, but it hasn't been advertised by any of the heavy users. Then it's very likely that that version is clean because the, 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 the heavy users are only advertising polluted and poison versions, and uh, they're not advertising clean versions. And finally, we would argue that if it's in this blue region over here, that is, if it's in this set here, then, then uh, if an advertisement comes uh, from a heavy user but not from a light user, then it's poison. Why is that? Because not, that means that no light user has a copy of it, so that means that most likely it doesn't really exist. It's a non-existent version. It's only a fake version being advertised for poisoning. 
So that's, um, so that's, so that's the heuristic we use. So, we, we, so again, to summarize the approach, we don't want to download any files. Instead, we crawl or uh, essentially crawl the network, get this metadata. We learn about all the versions and all the copies for a particular title. Then we do offline processing to, to classify the versions as either poison, clean, or polluted according to this very simple heuristic here. Okay? And uh, then, I'm not going to show a slide, but then we validated that heuristic by actually listening to some files and doing all that stuff and getting some undergraduates and graduate students involved. And we found that the heuristic was uh, very accurate, a very small um, uh, probability, of false, prob false positive and false negative probabilities. Yeah. Yeah, so numbers coming up. Okay, of course, you know. First, I'm just going to give a few of them here. So here's uh, Fast Track. So this is what the results gave at the end. So we looked at 10 titles here. It's number to 11, but these are 10 titles here. And so these were 10 very popular titles. They were, they were like the 10 most popular titles listed on the iTunes site or something when we did the experiment. And we see that some of these titles are under enormous attack here, right? So for example, if you look at, say, Title 7, that over 95% of all the advertised copies um, are either polluted or poisoned. So if you look at number 7 in Fast Track, uh, and Fast Track was like under enormous attack by the, by the recording industry in many ways. Legal attacks, these technical attacks, user attacks, they really because Fast Track was the leading file sharing system at that time, they really wanted to bring it down. So um, we see that 95% uh, of uh, you know, we see, uh, you know, uh, of the copies are 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 you know are not clean. With with a very fr you know, we have a, a very high fraction of them being poisoned, about 60, 60, 60 70, 65% being poisoned. Another 30% or so being polluted. Okay, so um, if you look, this is a slide that's more recent. If we had done this a year before, there was very little poisoning out there, and everything was just pollu uh, polluted. But over the years, what the, uh, the these companies have done is move away from pollution and more towards poisoning, most likely because it seems to do inflict as much damage, frustrate users as much. And it, and it requires less resources because you don't have to upload files as much. Okay. So anyway, so that's the we see that other files have different different files have different behavior. Like this file over here has you know some significant uh, uh, poisoning, but very very little pollution here. Okay. So that's that. If you look at Overnet, which is a more recent network, which where the tax the tax to Overnet are more recent. Because eDonkey emerged as a major player uh, uh, later in the game, um, we see that um, there's very, very little pollution going on. In fact, it appears that they didn't even bother to do pollution uh, for uh, for eDonkey and decided to, you know, sort of, you know, pretty much focus on on poisoning to frustrate users. And so again, we'll see that some titles are poisoned very heavily, with poisoning rates is up to 90%. Other titles are, are untouched, they're completely clean. All right? The way these companies typically work is that the record companies pay them per title. So it might be you know, X amount of dollars to attack a particular title. So for whatever reason, this is a title here, Title 2 and Title 10, were not attacked in eDonkey. So those are the, you know, we have a few other graphs like that in the papers, but that's, those are just two illustrative charts there. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, have you measured the effect of the attacks on the user experience? Because I'm thinking that I believe in eDunkey, it employs this notion of parallel downloading to download right. from different people. So, for example, for poisoning, it shouldn't have a large effect on the user experience. Right? Because you just go some, you know, to a guy, it doesn't respond to you, you just go somewhere, someone else. Right? You don't spend the time downloading a file as you would do with pollution. Uh, again, what matters is the user experience. Right? Right, now what matters is definitely the user experience, I agree. Um, I'm not curious you know, how this would uh, affect the, the user experience, if you have some insight on, on that. Uh, this is, uh, actually, I, you know, I've done, anecdotally, I have much more experience with, uh, with pulling around with uh, Fast Track, and I know that's very frustrating there, to get those more sources needed. 
here, um, so um, just go somewhere else. Yeah, it's very interesting to. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, to spend, yeah, I would just, just, you know, right. I would have to sp spend more time myself on that to respond better to that. But that's a good point. I think when the levels of poisoning are so high, trying to find new hosts are hard. Yeah, but right? finding the host is fast, right? It's not like, you know, it takes a few milliseconds. No, no, but. If you have a poison index, it's going to be harder to find. So you'll probably have more, more in instances where you won't be able to find it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So right? that's why I'm, I'm that's wondering how much the experience would degrade. You know, so right. I'm saying it wouldn't matter. I'm just saying that it would be right. a good research question to right. find out how much the, the I, download. I, right. I think this is the most serious attack because you can download and listen and go, okay, this person sucks, but at least you're getting something, right? Uh, on this one, um, you can totally you can be frustrated to the point where you won't ever find it, especially if they're poisoning it so bad that um, it's kind of like a black hole attack where everyone is pointing to a bad node, you know, that no one can ever get it. It doesn't feel that uh, the frustration will be lower here to me because uh, this is done automatically. So you launch your client and it finds clients automatically. Right? But, but, but here, you're, you're looking for a particular version for that title. Right, yeah, you that version just doesn't exist. So no matter whatever new host you go look for, they're all bogus hosts anyway. You're not no, getting anything. That's, right? that's not the case no. because you can see for every title there actually are clean things. Yeah. So I think right at the uh, right at the outset, uh, Professor Ross mentioned that the nature of the Overnet and the eMule or eDonkey client is that people will schedule downloads and then they'll just leave and come back the next day. In, in, in which case, an attack like this isn't very effective, which is the point this gentleman here is making. Because, I mean, you're going to leave it and it's eventually going to... Well, it's not internet. always that way. Like, you know, so, you know often people want to download a song and they want instant gratification. And, uh, I mean, I mentioned that, but, you know, in, I mean, if you ever use those systems and you see those more sources needed searching, very frustrating to see that over and over again to wait, right? So in some situations, right, if you went away, maybe this, you know, yeah, yeah, might not be that bad. So, yeah, right. Sure, no. I think that's, you know, more, you know, I, yeah, I, I'm sure that the, um, yeah, I think that's, an, you know, an interesting question. I think, I think you're, uh, the thing to note is that, you know, the, the title for that particular song, but there are many versions. And when you do a search and you want to download something, you're downloading that version. You're looking for that hash, right? So it doesn't matter if switch to other people, this other people just don't exist anyway. Right? You have to go find the right version that is clean. That's true, that's a, that's a good point actually. So, well, yeah, so when you select to download a, a song, you don't actually select to download a song, you're selecting to download a particular version. If that version doesn't exist, it just gets stuck. It doesn't look for an alternative version. It doesn't show an instance of this. In that case, it would, the whole graph would be blue. So if for, right. for all of these graph. titles here, all of these are actual files which are being poisoned. Yeah, so only for one title, including different versions. This yeah, is what that's right. Sure. One, yeah. With all the versions. Okay. okay, so this is multiple versions of the same title. Yeah. Right. So one title, this is title three, and this has all the, co this is the f all the copies with include, yeah, and all the versions in here, essentially. Given this data, isn't, isn't it the case that all 11 of these titles, if if they were able to be successfully downloaded based on the small fraction of clean users, would correspond to an actual file. It isn't an entirely bogus file, because if it was, you would have never had any clean data. No, no, okay. I th what's, so what happened? Let's talk about the user experience. The user does a search, right? It's going to get a list of um, all these different copies out there, right? Uh, some copies, well, you know, actually they'll have a list of different versions, and we'll say how many copies there are of each version. They usually like rank them, right? So you see like 20 copies available of this version, 10 of this one, 5 of that one. User, you'll typically go and choose the ones that have the most copies, right? So um, if you happen to choose one of the copies, you know, so, so some of these co copies correspond to bad versions, polluted, ver poisoned versions. Others correspond to existing versions. If you happen to choose one of them that corresponds to a non-existing version. Suppose you know the one that has 20 the most is, is an intact version. There's none of them existing. You click on it. 
It's just going to go out there and, and it's not going to find it and get stuck. Nothing's going to happen. You're, that's done. You've got to come back later and choose another version. Right? right? So yeah. what's the correlation between poisoning and pollution and the size of the file itself? Because that has an impact on the user experience as well, right? Because with high bandwidth links, if they're small music files, they quickly get downloaded and you can see that, hey, it looks like a bad file or a one byte file or a zero byte file. And you can move on to the next one. Whereas if it's a movie, you are kind of... Right, so that's, that's true. Way. All those studies, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, need to be done. And I'm sure that the, the, the polluting companies do, you know, have, try to do some studies like that so they can convince their clients that this is, you know, indeed useful. I was told that the, the, the um, you know, the, the RIAA actually hired a third party companies to evaluate, like doing some, something similar to what we're doing, uh, to actually evaluate the success, but probably taking into account these human factor issues as well, you know. So that company is called Big Champagne. So there's this other company that's like an independent company called Big Champagne. Some of you may have heard of them. They were hired to evaluate these companies. Yeah. Is there any correlation between um, the level of pollution and poisoning and how long the file has been out there in the song or the movie? If it's a newer movie, is the level of pollution higher or lower? Well, you know, initially there's a... Uh, you know, if you look at the, we have actually developed like these mathematical models for that as well in, in, in a symmetrics paper. But so in, for pollution, you know, initially file first gets released, let's say it's clean, no copies are polluted typically, right? Then the polluters come, they introduce them, and then man, the pollution starts to proliferate, and so the fraction of polluted copies starts to get larger and larger. Then the polluters stop at some point. They stop introducing new con polluted content because they're getting paid to do other titles or something. The users start filtering out the polluted content, taking it out of their, 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 uh, my shared fol their shared folder. So it starts to go down. So you've got a curve that comes up like this and then starts to come down like that. That's over time. That's typically what happens. Yeah. Okay. How much time do we have here? I don't want to... That much time? Okay. We have time to cover this. So the other issue that we went, we looked at in a, uh, another paper was attacks using these systems for attacks against um, arbitrary hosts. Okay. So how would you do that? So now this is something that uh, you know may or may not be happening in the real world. I don't know. We we were curious to see if it could be done. And so we wanted to do some minor, ex small experiments to see if we could get either fast track or overnet uh, to, uh, to perform a DDoS attack against some arbitrary host. So we created, you know, we just set up a host at Polytechnic University, which would be our target, and we tried to drive as much traffic. We tried to drive a lot of traffic to it. We didn't optimize the attack too much, but we, because we, 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 uh, we, you know, we we didn't want to bring down. Actually, we, we used Overnet. We didn't want to bring down Overnet with this attack, and we didn't want to overwhelm Poly either, a lot of traffic. We just basically wanted to illustrate whether it could be done or, or not. Um, you'll see in the conclusion, we will show that it can indeed be done. The level at which it can be done is still under some debate. It's not clear if, it, if, if you can use it to make a truly destructive attack or not, but um, we think it is, it is probably possible. So, so here's the idea. Um, so the target IP is, say, www.poly. We didn't attack the web server at Polytechnic University. We attacked another node. But, um, so what you do into um, Overnet, we advertise records. The same thing as the poisoning attack. We're just doing the poisoning now. We're going to poison that Overnet uh, system. And uh, so we advertise records, some Madonna hit, really say let's, whatever the hit is, some popular hit that's just come out. And we say that it's a located at um, poly IP address and the port number, say the mail server, whatever. And the idea what happens is users attempt to, they search and they, they search overnet, they find out that the Madonna hit's located here, and then a user will gener open up a TCP connection. This is this, uh, to that port. We advertise a port too, it might be port 25, it might be a mail server. So our node, our targeted node, will accept that a connection because we advertise a port that's, that's running on that, that target host. So our target host will accept that connection and send back 
When it receives a TCP SYN, it will send back a TCP ACK and eventually get um, another ACK back to set up the connection. So this is a, a denial of service attack where the target host is, 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 is um, lots and lots of unwanted hosts are setting up TCP connections to it. And it's, this is similar to the so-called SYN flood attack and a DDoS attack, but it's actually nastier than the SYN flood attack. Because in the SYN flood attack, what happens there is you open up half-open TCP connections, typically, what's done there. And, um, and there's, a, there's a very good defense to the SYN flood attack, and that's what these, these called the SYN flood cookies. Most operating systems deploy SYN flood cookies now to, uh, to prevent the SYN flood attack. But this cannot be, this, because you're opening, you're using, you're opening full, you know, you're creating uh, fully open TCP connections, uh, you can't use anything like SYN flood cookies here. So it's nastier than your traditional DDoS attack. So here's, an, so doing that, this is an experiment we did, where we, um, we went out and we, we, we poisoned um, the Overnet. Now Overnet has, has millions of nodes, so basically went out there and actually contacted a large number of those nodes and put, because each, you know, the, the distributed index in Overnet is distributed over all the nodes, and so we actually went and crawled Overnet and put in there, uh, using again a crawler developed by the, those, uh, the Jian and, and Naum, uh, and we actually um, uh, put these, these bogus information in there. And so then we kept track of how many TCP connections uh, we generated to the target host. And so what we did this attack up to about two hours from time zero. No, actually, we only did it, uh, excuse me, we only did this attack for 45 minutes, now I remember. So we did it for uh, this period of time. Okay. And, uh, and so what we see, this is really the, the number of fully established TCP connections here, which is in the order of uh, 250. And one thing that you, uh, we, is interesting is that even though we stopped the attack at time t equals 45 minutes, the attack persisted for hours here. That's because that bogus information stayed in the indexes. Even though we stopped doing the attack, it just persisted in there. And eventually, the bogus information gets timed out, and this thing will come down after a long period of time. Okay. So that you know what you know what is that conclusive? It just shows that you can, you know, use those systems to do something something damaging. One may argue, well, 250 TCP connections isn't that much. Like I said, we didn't spend a huge amount of time optimizing it. It may be possible to. Increase that by a factor of 10 if, if, uh, if one did a lot of optimization. Yeah? This is the number of TCP connections per watt. You're saying it's they're open at that time? Open. So how long are they left open? Okay, next slide. Yeah, that's good. No, that's a good point. So, yeah, so what this is saying here is say that one hour at our, our node at Polytechnic University, there were 260 TCP connections coming from overnet into our node, right? And how long, were, uh, how long are those connections open for? There, these are a, a, a diagram of that. We see that some of these TC connections would stay open for a very long time. So, um, so why is that? I mean, there's no useful data to transfer, right? Right. Since you knock out, and then that's it, right? You don't transfer any other data. You said that? What, what happened is that this, the arbitrary person who is looking for the file at the Polytechnic node uh, sends it will send a request for that file over the TCP connection, right? Now we're not running eDonkey there, so we have you know we we, we don't do anything with that request. So what's what's the, the node's going to do in general? The node is either going to just not reply, or send some kind of error message, or even crash potentially, right? These are possible things. So in our case, we just didn't do anything. We didn't send a reply. We just, we just and so that re, that request would come in, and we wouldn't close it. So it was really up up to the other side to close the connection, right? And yeah, you know, we see that some of these connections would just go on for a long time, you know, over two minutes, three minutes, you know, many of them on, you know, a minute or so longer. But the, uh. the longer the connections were left open, that means the less number of connections were being made. Of course. That's true. Right, right, right. But we're still <coughs> occupying TCP sockets there, right? Yeah. So it looks like you have uh, maybe 500 connections per minute or something like that? That's a good question. I don't have a statistic there, but it seems like a reasonable, yeah. Could this be explained by different versions of clients that are coming in to your service? I think so, yeah. yeah. Right. 
different versions and different operating systems and yeah. How would you optimize this stack? First of all, you'd have more machines and you would poison more overnet nodes. That's one thing you can do than what we were doing. Second thing, um, you can put, you can advertise more popular songs. We just did, we did a few songs. You can advertise 200 popular songs, right? And have them all, you know, say that you have all 200 of them, right? So these are some of the things that you can do. Yeah. Um, another kind of thing that you could do to try to do a, a DDoS attack is you could um, again, try to poison the routing table. Remember we said that these DHTs have routing tables, right? Where basically what happens is a message comes into a node and you know, basically the, the idea is to drive that message to a node that has identifier that's, that's close to the key so the routing tables do that, and you can go in there and try to poison those routing tables so that all this control traffic gets routed to the target host at Polytechnic University. All right, so that's what we basically did. So we send in messages uh, to the DHT, you know, that essentially like routing advertisement messages that would cause the routing tables and all the nodes to rearrange their pointers so that they point, uh, they, they direct traffic towards the target node. Okay, so um, this is you know uh, this is something that could, you know one could spend a lot more time advertising. We just sort of did this quick and dirty here, and um, <clears throat> what we got there in doing that was so this in this case we're getting we're not getting TCP connections. Instead, we're getting uh, uh, messages that are UDP packets that are being sent over the DHT. So these are control messages that are being sent, like search messages, published messages, et cetera, that are being sent over DHT. And we see there that uh, what, you know, the kind of traffic that we drove to our target node was, was not, so, you know, not enormous, but still something to you know, be concerned about is you know, on the order of 1.3 1, 1 megabits per second on average. Uh, again, it may be possible to, by optimizing the attack, to you know, increase the traffic significantly. Uh, one thing about this, though, this attack is as soon as we stop it, it pretty much ends, because um, that the, 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 those run, the, the entries in the route, routing table get updated very quickly. And so, if we don't send an update, you know, we, uh, our entries get timed out. And also, the other thing in Overnet is is that when over if when Overnet goes and sends one of these messages to the target node, and the target node doesn't respond, then Overnet will remove that entry from its routing table. So in order to, to maintain this attack, you have to sort of constantly, um, you know, uh, you have to constantly, you know, periodically refresh the, the routing tables with this, this, this bogus routing information. Yeah. Uh, what's the uh, uphold bandwidth or what's the attacking bandwidth in comparison to the receiving bandwidth? Right. So how much, how much traffic was sent uh, here? It, the amount of traffic actually in this attack, to be honest, is a good point. Was basically on the order of the amount of that's uh, that was being generated here. So you know, often when people this is really what they call a reflection attack when you do this kind of things. Like some people try to send traffic to DNS and get DNS in turn to send that traffic to a target node. And there you talk about the amplification factor. And here, so you know, you want an amplification factor that's you know, bigger the bigger the better. Here we're you're having an amplification factor maybe it's just a little over one. But you know, again, you know, just it's just sort of a you know, additional research might be able to optimize this attack and get an, a much higher amplification factor. Do you have, uh, Professor, do you have the actual, um, since you guys did all this study, do you have actual capture, uh, packet captures of the attack? Yeah, we have that, sure. Okay. Yeah. Because we you know, might be interested in looking at it and see if we can leverage some of the Right. We have it. I, you know, my, sure. We can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a quick slide here showing that it's it, it's definitely it is indeed coming from many different um, sources. So this is this is taken over like thirty second intervals, and we say that see that every each thirty second interval the, the attack is coming from about sixteen hundred different nodes in this. Um, 
in this, this Rodney attack that we talked about. It's not coming just from one node. It's coming from a lot of different places. Do you have an insight why that spike is there? No, I don't. Um, no idea. If my, if, um, see, uh, no, I, sorry, I don't have a good, you know, that, I was looking at my notes today, and I said, someone's going to ask that question. <laughs> it did happen. Okay, so, uh, so summary here. Um, pollution and poison attacks, we've talked about both of those. Uh, you can attack an arbitrary title. We developed a methodology to evaluate success of attack without downloading content. And uh, this, this methodology also leads to a distributed blacklisting scheme, which I didn't talk about. If you'd like, though, I can spend a few minutes talking about that, but we'll see if there's any questions for that. Uh, but anyway, it's not too hard to see that basically the idea behind a distributed black, the, the blacklisting scheme is identify the users that are advertising an excessive number of copies and blacklist them. Okay? That, that's going to help you get rid of lots of the, po you know, lots of the poisoning. Then the next issue is how do you do that in a distributed manner? How do you implement such a, a distributed blacklisting algorithm? So we've done some work on that. Uh, and if you'd like, we can talk about that. But, um, and the so other thing that we did here was we also looked at these DDoS attacks. And we looked at two different ways of doing DDoS attack. One is doing index poisoning. The other is routing poisoning. This one looks a little bit more promising at the moment. But uh, I think both of these are still, yeah. So I guess one of the things to take away from, from this whole research is one is that these, a lot of these, a lot of these a lot of P2P systems and where arbitrary users can publish content and can publish information um, are very susceptible to attack, okay? We've seen that, that people, people have been attacking them, does appear to be successful, very, very uh, susceptible to attack. The other thing is, is that, be, again, because that there are a lot of nodes out there, they, you know, they offer the possibility for a large-scale DDoS attack, and especially, again, when users can publish to them very easily, like publish index information, publish records into the indexes very easily. So when building P2P systems in the future, whether they're file-sharing systems, whether they're voice over IP systems, whether they're uh, video distribution systems, whatever, it's important to keep in mind these issues um, as we, as we, you know, as we go forth in our design. That's it. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a new kind of something similar to poison coming up in P2P distributed systems. Like, suppose I uh, look for a file saying a song. They give me the song, but it's not actually the song. It's some kind of virus or something which, when you download it, it hangs the whole system or crashes the whole system. Does that happen? Have you seen that? Yeah. It's sort of hard. Because I guess it's too, you know, there, right, you think the song is MP3, so you're going to run it through it. Not exactly like an application. I was looking for some application. Oh, an application? Yeah. Oh, that might happen if you download an application through a, a file sharing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. From a file sharing system? Yeah. And then you run the application. It automatically runs and... Sure. That, that can happen. Anytime you bring in, you know, some kind of executable code into your... System, whether it's from file sharing or anywhere, you know, songs shouldn't have that problem. Quote an MP3 because basically you're just going to run that through the MP3 player, so it shouldn't. If it's a you know, if it's a song or if it's something that you think is a song, shouldn't be a problem because if it's if it's just an MP3 player opening it, assuming that the, the MP3 player doesn't have a vulnerability, it shouldn't be, you know, it should be okay. Can a song uh, initiate an application, something like that? Is there any possibility? Unless you have loopholes in the browser or the player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for example, for JPEG, I think they mentioned there is some loopholes here, and we issue a patch which closed that loophole. Yeah. And then you click on the song which has the MP3 uh, suffix, that's going to launch an MP3 player, right? So it will launch something. Yeah. But like you're saying, if there's a if there's a problem with one of those players, J, if it's a, you know if, J, if it's an image, it's a JPEG, and then yeah, if that has a vulnerability, yeah. Otherwise, you should have no problem. If it's EXE, well, this is a virus attack. And the, uh, the attack is the same if I put the virus in the EXE and put it in some kind of shear, shear file, or shear layer. So you always have to be aware if you download it. Question? 
in your experience, what, what is the percentage of uh, the polluting nodes as as a percentage of the entire population of, of plants out there? Oh, well, it's a very small percentage. One percent, one tenth of a percent. Yeah, well, you're less certainly less than one, probably closer to one tenth of a percent. Yeah. So in our blacklisting thing, we, we, we wouldn't blacklist individual nodes. Our sort of approach was to blacklist slash 24 networks because the idea is that typically those people are operating, from, they own their own slash 24 network, and they can easily move around within that. So, um, so you know, but so, yeah, that's, but yeah, it's just a rel relatively small number of nodes. But there's so many, you know, these t systems have two, three million nodes. So if you talk about, you know, 1%, that's how many two th of uh, 1 million. 1% 1 is 10,000. 10, so 0.1% is 1,000 nodes. So There's still a significant number of, of machines there at 0.1%, right? Yeah. Can you talk a bit about your blacklisting scheme? Okay, so just the basic, very high level, the idea is, um, it's like, for example, in Fast Track, uh, you know, each super node can, can go and look, at, identify the heavy users ones that are advertising lots and lots of uh, uh, versions and copies, lots of copies. And so those that are, you know, they're, you know, that are advertising 100 times more or 1,000 times more than the average, basically we have a, th we sort of calculate the average, and, and if you're like 1,000 times more as a threshold, we label you as a, as a, as a polluter, okay? So it's an automatic scheme. And so, um, Actually, what we do is actually sign a, repu uh, a reputation. Uh, okay, yeah, we label you essentially as a, uh, a polluter, and, and we sign you a reputation corresponding to, you know, corresponding to this. So we do that by the subnet basis rather than by individual node basis. And then, you know, the sort of the distributed scheme is then that the the super nodes now they each have a sort of local vision of. Of, of, of certain subnets, which and they have reputations for each of the So all the subnets that they're dealing with, they have assigned their reputation to each one. And then they can exchange those reputation values with each other. And for that, we would, we, you know, there's lots of reputation, uh, distributed reputation algorithms out there. There's one that gets a lot of press, it's called Eigen, Eigen, Eigentrust. And uh, so you could, for example, use that Eigentrust thing. So each super node, calculates local reputation values of the subnets that it's talking to, and then they exchange that, and then in the end you get sort of this global picture. Each supernova will get a global picture of, of different um, uh, subnets and the reputations associated with them. And then, you could, and then the supernode could send that information back down to its children, and children could block out. So just basically wouldn't even put on the screen any content that's advertised from any of those subnets. Now, one issue that you have, of course, is that one of the supernets, super nodes can also be taken over and corrupted, and so be sending out bad reputations. That's when this, that's where something like eigentrust comes in, because that's it's supposed to. You know, that's the, you know, sort of the idea that's when you have a relatively small fraction of your nodes that are uh, malicious, then it'll still work because it's sort of the, you know all, it sort of all mixes together so that the, you know if the number of malicious nodes is not too many, not you know it'll still do well. Oh, so that's just sort of so. Oh, yeah. So basically, well, we did some work on that scheme, and um, so here, like you know, here basically, this is the IP space here of different slash twenty four networks, and these are the reputations. The reputation one is high. So for each network, this is each IP network, we assign the reputation, and uh, in reputation, the higher the number, the higher the reputation. The lower, the lower. This is plotted on the log scale. What we see is that there are some nodes there that have extremely low reputations. There's some IP uh, slash 24s, you know, all the ones down here. So what our scheme would do is probably draw a cutoff here you have to develop a heuristic for exactly where you put the cutoff, and then just blacklist all these slash 24 networks here. Yeah. Is this public work or? Yeah, it's in our, it's in our papers. Yeah. Yeah. Will this list be dynamically updated, or is it something that just for the study? This list? Yes. What list? This blacklist. Or <laughs> oh, uh, no, yeah, we haven't, I mean, this is something, we don't have it running full time here. 
We just, you just did it once showing that it could work. But in general, if you were to deploy this, it would be dynamic. You would, each supernova would be constantly reevaluating the local reputations uh, of, of the IP addresses that connect to it and then distributing those through this eigentrust algorithm. So it would be constantly adapting, right? So that's people, you know, it may be, you know, you know, the, the attackers may, may move from one building to another to get a new, a new slash 24, right? So. They can pollute their, their what their source. They can pollute the blacklisting as well. How can they pollute the blacklisting? Yeah. Maybe they can't, but this. Yeah. Well, they can blacklist other Who could blacklist? The attackers. Well, no, but it's, it's the uh, it's the super nodes that are doing the blacklisting, right? But they're not uh, fully connected to every other super node. No. So you're saying that they, they only blacklist, they only know to blacklist people that are locally. Right, but then they use, the, they, they take, they have the reputations of each of the local ones. And they exchange that information with all their neighbors. The neighbors, there's this eigentrust algorithm. That they, the neighbors will aggregate that information, what they receive from their neighbors, what they have, so pass that on to other neighbors. And it's just this. If I'm a bad supernova, right, I can start polluting that with that information. Right. But the point but, is that the, the, the production is small, but notes is small. Right. So this eigentrust algorithm, which is a separate paper, not our paper, you know, basically that's the main issue there is like suppose you you know you have like you know a thousand nodes participating and five or ten percent are malicious doing anything they want, it'll still work out so that the reputations that people get for the most part are, are valid reputations or accurate reputations. Another heuristic which can be used is probably to get user input, right? Because the users who are eventually going to listen to the songs know whether the songs are valid or not, and that reputation factor can be factored into right. this reputation. So that's been done where people, you know, listen to versions, right, of a song, and then they th there was some of e Tonky at one point, and then people would post like to essentially like a message board. This version is fine. This version is fine. And they keep track of all the good versions. And then the eDonkey client itself would actually connect to that and f see which versions are good. And I guess you know, there's a couple different things that go along. You can have malicious users posting to that. The other, but the problem that they ran into is the RIAA. It was like a central site. And R said, you know, let's get that. You know, it went after that site, and they took it down very quickly. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's a different type of attack on the blacklisting stuff that may or may not work, I don't know, which is... If you have a malicious uh, super node, you could blacklist every single prefix there is right. and try to blow out the tables on the other end and have that cause havoc. Blow out tables? The table of blacklists that are shared. Right. And you're consuming up to 2 to 24 entries in their table, and if they're not prepared to deal with that, then they might be kicking out things, not blacklisting things that might be the real bad things, and so on. Right. But suppose, okay, it's basically the way it would work in eigentrust is that you're just really a malicious super node. You blacklist everyone. That's all the slash 24s, right? Then you send that information to the other nodes. The, the, the other nodes are, re are receiving reputations about those same slash 24s. The individual reputation of an individual one is fine, as right. long as they can actually keep 2 to the 24 entries in their table. If their implementation is such that they can't actually store 2 to the 24 entries, right. then you have an attack. That's sure. right. Sure. Right. It's an orthogonal to the page ranking algorithm. It's orthogonal, but you know, they should be able to store that much. Right? If you can cause them to kick out the valid, valid blacklist ones, then you can get them to kick you out and have, have you look like you're a good reputation. Sure, that yeah. kind of thing is, yeah. right, yeah. It's a memory attack on them. For interesting parties, why don't we have form a small group and uh, we can discuss with uh, Professor Ross uh, this afterwards. Fascinating lecture. Oh, thank you. Um, so some of our questions.